Hello, welcome to the Dadco Show. I'm your host, Terry Chu. Today, my special guest is Jason, who is on a mission to revolutionize parenting all the way from the United States. He has 15 years experience of coaching parents. Today, we speak to him about his journey in business and as a parent. Jason, welcome to the Dadco Show. Thank you so much for having me. Just for the viewers uh, uh, out there, Jason and I have I've spoken before and I keep getting this wrong. I keep getting the time zones wrong. Uh, so what time is it over there? Where are you? So right now I'm in the New York, New Jersey area and um, it is almost 11.15 a.m. Okay, good, good. Well, we are we are at the end of the, the afternoon here. So we are uh 4:15ish over here in the UK and we've got some terrible weather over here what's it like over there in uh, in the New York state right now there's the sun is shining it seems like the weather oh. is in the uh, like <laughs> 70 75 it's, it's actually oh, wow. really, it's been raining over the past couple of days but today and yesterday it's been beautiful Wow, excellent, excellent. Okay, well, th thanks for taking the time out of your uh, hectic schedule. Are you are you currently still in lockdown? Is it is it still lockdown over there where you are? So the stay at home order has been officially lifted after uh, well, starting June sixth, the, the official you have to stay at home is is done. And um, here in our state, New Jersey, we are have um, a couple of different phases, three phases to get back into you know uh, the 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 old, the new normal, I guess. Um, oh. But um, we're officially in what's called phase two of, of the programming for the state. So um, I look forward to in a week, I should be able to get a haircut again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to that. I've been trying yeah. to maintain the best of my ability, but um, I'm not a barber, so I definitely miss my barber. Um, but things like childcare has just opened this week. Um, they're anticipating after July 6th that um, uh, summer camps for children can go on. Um, oh, okay. And they're, they're starting to, like after July 7th, they'll have outdoor graduations for those seniors who are graduating in 2020. Um, so it's, um, it's definitely interesting times, you know, and I'm just putting one foot in front of the other to see what comes next. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good, good stuff. Well, we'll cover a bit more about how you've sort of coped with the lockdown and your business and, and, and parent and, and, you know, and, and childcare. First of all, tell us a little bit about your line of work and the industry that you're in. Absolutely. So currently, my industry, by, by trade, I'm what's called a licensed clinical social worker and a parent coach. So um, basically, I'm a therapist. Um, what I do is I, I counsel families, um, parents, and their children. Um, I particularly love working with ch um, the parents of children in the age range of like 18 months to about 12. Um, I can work with teenagers. Um, I can work. I, I'm, not, I'm consider myself as a family worker. So okay. the client necessarily, the person I serve isn't necessarily the, the mother by her, herself, or the father by himself, or just the kid. I can do all those things. I have multi, you know, uh, skill sets. But sure. I particularly am um, moved to serve the family unit. It's that invisible thing that connects everybody. I see. Okay. And, and how long have you been doing what, what, what you've been doing? So I've been in this line of work high for... Let's just round it up to 15 years. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, do you, 13, but very close. Sure. 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 And tell me about your family. You know, who's at home? I have, I have a daughter. Uh, her name is Jasmine. Uh, she is two years and almost five months. On the, wow. On June 25th. So, um, she's, uh, she's amazing. I mean, I probably speak hours and hours about her. Um, but right now I'm currently a single dad. Um, things did not work out between her mother and I. However, we do successfully co-parent, um, you know, uh, with the, the current coronavirus uh, situation. Um, her mother's job is um, not open, so she's home. Um, I've always, for a long time, more or less worked from home during the day. So my schedule hasn't changed much, but I have, I have my daughter two days on, and then two days with my mother, and then two days with me, 
because she's so young, it's not a good idea for a child not to see either parent. Absolutely, more than absolutely. Two, two to three days, you know. So we we successfully. The only reason I leave my house either to go food shopping or to pick up my daughter and bring her. Um, so I don't have her today. In terms of uh, so two and a half. So I have uh, I have a seven year old and I have a a just turned three year old. Uh, boy, three-year-old boy, and so I've got a boy and a girl, and so I I I know the the, the challenges of of both. How have you found, particularly, you know, in the current climate, of juggling work with uh with 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 a child of that age? You know, in terms of then you know their need for you. Absolutely. So I will start with a lot of my personal history has prepared me for this moment. Um, okay. You know. When you look at me and you're like, oh, you know, um, you know, I identify as a, a parent coach and you're like, okay, cool. You got a two and a half year old. What's that? Um, so I've reached the stage where it, it's more important. My history is more telling of why I'm so comfortable right now. And I, I mean, the actual stay at home order has not changed my schedule at all. So I, I, prior to this, um, my daughter stays home. I'm, I have her during the day prior to the stay at home order. Um, I'm basically the daycare. So I have her early in the morning. We have breakfast. We, we do some activities, watch a little bit of TV. We have nap time. We have lunch. We get up. We do some more activities. So in essence, my schedule hasn't changed at all other than I'm seeing her less than I used to. Um, I am a self-proclaimed child whisperer and I will, you know, I'm in this 15 years and I can't I can't pretend that like, oh, it's so hard. It's so granted. When you, when you hear my history, it will make more sense. So I'm gonna come across with a little bit of ego, but um, I have no child challenges. Um, it's a way of life for me. Um, it's literally, I've had a very long driver's ed course to train to be prepared for my daughter. So I couldn't be more confident, happy, um, just overall, amazed as a father. Um, of course, she has her challenging moments. No child um, is perfect, um, but I feel fully equipped to handle anything thrown my way. Yeah, I think that's quite rare that, that you hear, you know, parents, especially, you know, fathers say that, you know, that, that there are, you know, less challenges uh, than, than others. I think most, um, I think a lot. I think I think there's a lot of stigma, you know, in the modern world uh, about parenting because certainly I think feel that a lot of parents feel that you know children are more demanding in terms of uh, their 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 needs uh, today than say for example when we were children. I don't like to compare um, today's children with you know when we were kids because obviously my parents did the same with me because I, I think modern society moves on and you know the you know children live in a, a more complex rich world nowadays compared to say you know when you and i were perhaps children um, so obviously they're going to demand more because there's more there for them to demand right so i mean uh, listen, you're gonna love talking to me because i you know i'm gonna sprinkle some cool stuff in there so i agree with you a thousand percent we are not living in the same world um as when we not. were growing up and the funny part is I wouldn't have this job, this job that I do, that literally I fell into, would not in, my, in terms of my business, my job, my career, my passion in life, um, would not exist 15 years ago. You know, I've noticed, like I said, I identify as a parent coach. So this idea of, I turned parenting into an industry. Like, you don't go to school yeah. for parenting. Absolutely I, not. I feel like a father, grandfather, whatever, some kind of pioneer, and whether I get the credit or not is irrelevant. Uh, I do feel like I'm a pioneer in turning parenting into like a profession. Mm. That's kind of be, that's what I, I think I want to be known for. Um, so you are a thousand percent correct. And here's why. Um, since the beginning of time, the formula, children and parents have always operated with the same formulas. All right. Okay. The first formula children have always operated with, I want what I want and I want it now. Since the beginning of child, like since the, the very first child, the cries for hunger, the, the cries for their needs to be met. I want what I want and I want it now. 
Now, the formula for parenting has always been since the beginning of time. I want better for my child than I had for myself. Sure. Say it again for effect. I want better for my child than I have for myself. Even misguided parents who do some horrendous things, a lot of times when they self-evaluate, they'll say, well, it wasn't as bad as I had it. Or, you know, it wasn't, you're definitely getting a better end of the deal than I had. So even when parents screw up from time to time or make poor decisions, their, their formula is still, my child's going to get better than what I had. So what has changed is over time, we have gone through multiple different societies. And because of technology, you know, we have this mom, we have this new mommy and daddy button that parents before us never had to face. So for example, we're a farming society. Okay, we're planting corn. We gotta wait five months. If if the the child was screaming, I want cornbread, I want cornbread right now, and it's it's 1852, the parents would be like, Go kick rocks, you know, uh, go play in the river, come back when you know the you know when it's when it gets dark. They wouldn't feel like shitty parents. Mind my, my I apologize my sorry for the language, but they no, wouldn't absolutely feel, not. They wouldn't feel like they were doing something wrong. The corn bread was ready when the corn grew, when it was harvested, when the family, you know, got it and then took hours and hours to make it. See nowadays, and you know, as humans, we don't even really understand technology has sped up life so fast that we get everything in an instant. Everything yeah. is this. Everything is already made two weeks ago. So I think um, as we were growing up, we were kind of at the tail end where we didn't disrupt the, the formulas. You know, parents felt like competent parents. Yes, they had challenges, but they weren't, you know, they were backing up the school system if the child was misbehaving. Or, you know, if you did something wrong, your neighbor would say something about it. Over time, at least over, I also have to put into account we're over in America, so we're a little different as well. So um, I feel like other countries are more family oriented, where we're a little bit more individualistic, which um, has its pluses and minuses. So, but I know definitely over here, um, now that we can get things in an instant, children always want what I want now. But now a parent feels like crap because they, can, in order to teach their child something, they now have to deliberately withhold. They have to deliberately, like if you want to, if you want to teach your child patience. You have to deliberately make them wait and watch them suffer and make them feel pain. And this is, this is, this is pressing the, the mommy daddy button that never happened before. So wow. to sum it up, get things so quickly now that children are still living out their same formula, but parents now have to adjust to a totally new, new way of life that we have no frame of reference. Well, that is that is powerful stuff. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've always said that the the, the devices. Obviously, my seven year old is you know big on her device now. You know, on her iPad, and she's born into this world. And you are absolutely spot on, Jason. Into this demand on demand society, everything is on demand. They want to watch a cartoon. It's on Netflix or or Prime or whatever it is. They want some food. It's delivered like that. We go on an app and we deliver it. We, we order supermarket deliveries. Now, we're in, you know, we haven't, you know, my family hasn't left our house in three months because everything just gets delivered. Amazon Prime, it gets delivered in two hours in some, in some cities, you know, and, and you're absolutely right in that they, I never thought about that, that, they, they, that the children have always asked for things now, now, now. Um, Unfortunately, they can get it now in this day and age. However, right. and I've never thought about it in terms of the parenting part of that is that to become a good parent that you actually withhold the demand. And that's, you know, that, the, the supply even. That, that, is, that is fascinating. And, and actually, you're absolutely right. I think, and I never thought about it in theory that, Actually, now we we to be uh, for me to do my part and train in, in in teaching my kids that I actually have to withhold stuff rather than back in my day I you know if I wanted to watch cartoons when I was you know my you know my my three year old age I just had to wait until cartoons came on. Yep. You know, it's not just on demand. 
and so there's a, as a parent coach, you know, there's an intergenerational message that I have to kind of teach, not just the, the parents who are facing this, this challenge, but aunts and uncles and, and, and grandparents, they're looking at new parents like, what the hell are you doing? Why is this so <laughs> difficult? They have no frame of reference. Absolutely. So there's this inter, like, I'm, I'm telling you, for parenting, everything shifted. And we're going to look back, we're gonna, you know, 50 years from now, whatever, 10 years from now, I don't know. But we're going to look back, and I pinpoint, in my own personal theory, is somewhere around the time where the world or the majority of the, the modern world could not function without a cell phone. In other words, everybody had to have a cell phone. There was a shift somewhere between 1998 and 2002. The world shifted. And I feel like that that's when my industry was born. Wow, really? Okay, that's, that's, that's fascinating because everyone had a device and everyone started to become... Um, reliant on this little this little device right amazing right. yeah I, I think you're absolutely right so you you say the demand from children hasn't really changed never changed they always want the same things you know uh, oh. they want um, all the basic needs food water clothing love shelter um, as people we have to feel like we belong to something so um, their needs have have not changed since day one Interesting. So you, so, so, so you feel the device there, the, the phones, the smartphones, but at that point when those devices became popular, that, that was when your industry was, was, was born. Yeah. I almost feel like parenting didn't need school. I mean, it, it always, it's always, it's always good to get support. Again, here's where you're going to notice a little bit of like Western versus Eastern or, you know, Euro European versus American, but at least in, in America and in my area in America, because there's always, there's always differences. Another thing about parenting is that parents are using a very predictable way of interacting with their kids. Um, before they meet me, before they hear what I teach, before what I bring to the table comes, comes into play, I can predict that you're either one, doing, not you personally, all parents. All parents are either doing exactly what was done to them or they're doing the exact opposite of what was done to them. This is our map. This is our guidance system. And unfortunately, it no longer works. And it connects to me as a parent because I, I've had one long driver's ed course. Since 2000, every day I've been, dead for the past 20 years, I've been dedicated to learning about children, working with children, and then I got really good. I didn't, I didn't originally know how to make children listen. I didn't. In my early 20s, um, I actually couldn't get children to listen to me at all. I was just really the fun guy, have a good time. But structure and all that stuff, I, I didn't know how to do. So I worked in after school programs. Um, I did different like babysitting jobs and things like that. I always worked a lot of different jobs. But in, for my industry, these are the relevant jobs. Um, and over time, I, I worked at a psychiatric hospital for children, for three to six-year-olds. And it's literally, they call me Mr. Jason, but it's where I learned everything. They had mental health professionals on staff. They had child psychiatrists, which give medicine to children. And the behaviors that I was exposed to, just to name a few, is a child would get upset, uh, destroy the room, uh, you know, throw their clothes off, get naked, run around the building. Like very, very extreme behaviors that for the first, let's say, year of the job, I was just like, whoa, what the heck do you do? You know, um, but over time, I took it very, very seriously. And I started learning and I really, I almost feel like with parenting, I got to slowly dip my toes into the process without having a child of my own to, to then say, you know what, I want to do this. I love this. I like this. This is for me where most parents, they're just kind of thrusted into this leadership position with no real training, for lack of better words. You do your best. You, I do what was done exactly to me, or I do the opposite of what was done to me. That's our formula. Um, but I also have the opportunity that, you know, for about a decade of my life, I was previously married, and she had two, two boys. So I was a stepdad for, uh, for a six- and four-year-old, and I raised them for about 10 years. So 
everything that I was doing on the job, I was bringing home to that to my family. I was a stepdad. Um, as time, so during that time period, I'm also, I go into people's homes, almost like the super net. I literally, if you can't get your child to go to bed, my job is to go to your house and show you how to get your child to go to bed. Wow. So okay. I have a three-step process. And it's basically, I do it for you the first couple sessions. I do it with you the next couple sessions. And then I get myself out of there for the next couple sessions. So it's a process where I show you it's possible. Then I do it with you. And then I get the heck out of there because I'm really, I can get into that later. But that's, that's the process. So what am I saying? While I was a stepdad for 10 years, I was using it in my own home with my stepchildren. I've been in over 250, uh, 200, after 200 homes, I stopped counting. Wow. I've been yeah. in so Amazing. Many homes, so many homes. I, I do sleep training, feeding, uh, sibling fighting, um, you know, uh, getting them to bed on time, doing their homework. This is literally my job, my profession, my career, my passion. So when you hear this superficial answer, oh, children are easy. This is nothing. It's a cakewalk with my daughter. I put it, I was in the trenches for 15 years and I wasn't, it was on my own pace. It was my own choice. And I was like, yes, this is for me. So I have a compassion for parents. It's like, there's, there's no heads up. There's no map except for Absolutely. that we're given. And they're just thrown into something, whether they're ready or not. And what I feel like is I learned how to be a leader, not necessarily be a good parent. So I lead, I teach leadership skills to parents and I use the leadership skills personally with my children, with my stepkids, with every day up until the, the pandemic, I'm in, I'm in homes 20 mm -hmm. hours a week. Wow. Wow. It's a way of life. In the UK, we have, um, before you have a child, you can, um, you can have antenatal courses. And it, it teaches you some very basic things, predominantly for, for the mother, breastfeeding, um, how to, you know, how to change, how to bath your, how to bathe your, your children, you know, very basic things, um, but very practical things, you know, what happens during labor, what to expect, those types of things. But you're absolutely right. There is no training for the emotional or, or physical, I guess, in, in some cases of being an actual parent. I'm so surprised that there isn't, there hasn't been any training now. And then and what you're offering here is, you know, parenting training. And that's, that's amazing. Over the past, it's called it 10 years of going to people's homes. Sometimes, you know, I, I work with people who are, have no money whatsoever and live in what we call projects or urban areas. I go into their homes. I've worked in people who are, live in mansions and have millions of dollars because money has nothing to do with parenting at all. Mm. So, I say that because over, over the years, I'm in homes and sometimes it's just working with mothers. Oftentimes, if there's a father present, like if they're married or whatever, I report or live in the house, stepdad, I always require the, the fathers to be a part of it. So like, um, like, for example, I would purposely wait till you were done with your, your, your work to go into your home. Like I wouldn't go and work with the family if a father is present, if he okay. wasn't there. It's Interesting. All parents are required. So what happens is I learned over time that the way moms lead, moms give children certain gifts and, and fathers give uh, children other gifts that they're not opposite, they're complementary. There are gifts that mothers give that fathers can't give and there's gifts that fathers give that mothers can't give. So. Sure. I learned over time, I've adjusted my curriculum to teach mothers a way to lead the family, but it can only go to a certain extent because the onus in general in society is that if a father is present, they lead the families. Fathers lead the families. I have a little formula. Fathers lead the families and mothers are still the CEO of the home. That's how it works. So the general movement of or the trajectory of the family is led by the father. Interesting. Okay. That's interesting. But the day to day in home, eating, sleeping, feeding. I mean, I mean, they tell you like 
Think of, for example, um, when you have a woman, they turn a house into a home. That's mm. a very powerful phrase. So when you have the male and the female together, fathers lead the families, mothers are the CEO of the home, even though it's 2020 and some women are like, well, I'm past that. I can go work. I can run businesses. Yes, you can. We're not in the 50s. I'm just saying that humans have been around for a much longer time, and there's always been a division of labor. So I have an understanding of that division, and one's not better than the other. They're complementary. You need both. So the child can't pick loyalties. What's my point? My point is I've adapted a father curriculum because the leadership message to mothers is different from the leadership message to fathers. So with that, this is how we came across. Um, a spinoff of my company, which is called The Home Parent Coach, I, I created a program called Fathers Leading Families. So which is how we, which is how we met. This is how we met, right? So when you're like, what's up? You do what? What's your name? Do I know this guy on the other screen? It's because we met under the umbrella of the company, The Fathers Leading Families, which I started about 10 months ago. Okay. And I'm a therapist by trade. I understand that men are not very big at sitting down and talking and sharing their feelings. But I'm, as a guy, I've never had challenges getting fathers and men who um, involved who want to be involved. So I'm using that to my advantage. And I'm, I basically started an Instagram page and made it a virtual support group for fathers without calling it a support group. Yeah, sure. It's fantastic. Uh, that's, that, that's how we met. In fact, I, I can't remember if you found me or I found you. I, I can't remember which way. It doesn't really matter. But what, you know, the, the messages that you share, you know, some of the interviews that you do, you know, I've been on your show, I've been on your, you know, on your live. Um, and, and I think it's, I think it's a, a great message that you're, 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 you're trying to share. What, of all the parents, of all the fathers that you've, um, either coached, mentored, given advice to, talked to, you know, you must have heard lots of stories with challenges that, you know, that, that they have come across. How do you tell people, how do you get people to stay positive during challenging periods? How do you stay positive during, you know, some lower times? And, do, you know, do you have to be an optimist to sort of, um, have a career as well as being a parent, being a good parent. How 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 do you stay positive? Very, I love the question because remember, I'm always gonna, I'm always gonna think in terms of, like my history. I, I keep alluding to my history because it's relevant to why I am who I am and what I do today. So I, I like to take just a moment for the viewers, and I'm very comfortable with this conversation because, um, you know, this has been a 30, 30 year experience for me. So what, sure. what, what's going to be talking to the viewers or to yourself uh, to, to hear, you know, is just regular for me. So um, part of my drive in general is that when I was young, I, I call myself an adult survivor of early loss. It's the best way to call it. So um, I'm going to go right through it in a, in a, a rapid fire, you know, uh, sure. like, whoa, go whoa. ahead. So, so uh, my first memory was a year and a half, um, waking up to the death of my brother. Um, oh my. my baby brother was, um, he was about a month old, something like that. Um, my mother woke me in a panic because I pieced together later that is because my brother died. And I guess she was checking to see if, if I was still breathing as well. So- And you were, uh, how old were you, sorry? One and a, a year and a half. Wow. I, I remember the emotion. I don't remember much, but I remember the emotion of being woken up in an extreme, not a fire, not a literal fire, but an emotional explosion. Sure. Um, and that, that's my first memory, you know. Um, from there, as time went on, my, my father passed away when I was six. And then 10 months later, my mother passed away when I was seven. So... By the time I was seven, my immediate family was all gone. So I have a very different life, you know, and it, it, I have to say, when you ask me, how do I, you know, how do I handle adversity? It's, it, it's important to know that part of it I feel like is in my control and part of it is something that I feel is not in my control. 
So sure. for everything that makes it, wow, he's so strong, he's so put together, how does he do this? I really feel for myself that part of it is my temperament, my natural personality, um, you know, um, and part of it is something that something bigger is looking out for me and I don't control. It. So always think when you hear me, if you hear like arrogance or ego, it's because that's the part that I feel like I had some control over. But the other part is like, I have no idea. So here's, here's what I mean, put it in context. So I really believe that God, life, source, whatever you believe in, purposefully snipped off a part of the brain, in my brain, that is either overly rageful or overly despair. From very young, maybe around the time of my mother's death, I don't know, but I don't get super rageful. I don't fight. And I also don't, um, I'm not Rachel, and I don't like, oh, I want to hurt myself. I, I want to end my life. I, I, I cannot get in either extreme. And I don't feel like that's in my control. I feel like God, somebody was looking out for me and say, you're going to go through some hard stuff. And if those wires connect, I'm not going to be able to help use you for what you're here for. I, you know, so, um, so that's out of my control. I don't know how I'm so calm. <laughs> but part of me is part of it that is in my control is I've always been um, kind of deep, profound. I look at things, um, I hear things. Like I, I feel like because my eyes aren't as strong and since very young, like I always needed glasses. They say when one sense kind of is not as strong, other that's right. Over, the other over, compensate over. for it, yeah. So I can literally, when I hear something, I, I'm an auditory learner. I, I get imagery in my head. So basically, people go into either fight, flight, or freeze. These are the three right. main responses that every human being goes through. I'm more of a freezer by nature. I don't run. I don't fight. I don't fight. And I mostly you stay freeze, close. I just like, don't move. Everybody, don't move. So in my nervous system, there's a part of me that... Anger doesn't feel good. I don't like it. I, I'm just being honest. Like, oh, you're a guy. You must get racial. No, not really. I, I get hurt. I feel disappointed. I get sad. But I'm not rage. I'm not rageful. I feel frustrated. I feel angry. But I'm never like rageful. So, so to answer your direct question, which you need kind of needed the background information. I've been through a lot, which helped. And, and from there, I've had a, other, a, a lot. Of, many of my challenges have gone up until about two, three years ago. And I'm still living out a lot of dramatic things. But sure. um, it has given me, not having an immediate family has given me the drive. Every person, when you belong to a family, you, you give, certain, like you get something and you give something in a family. It's the exchange. What children and people, as you learn, as you grow up, you basically learn that, okay, here's what you do for your family, and, and then here's what you, you don't do with other people. Like, you know, let's say your mom needs a, a ride to the airport. You'll drop everything, and you'll go take your mom to the airport. Your brother has this challenge. You don't really want to, but you're like, I got to go help my brother. You know, what a lot of people, I feel like what I'm doing is special, but also very common. You know, everybody has an overflow of energy to give to their own family. So I have all oh. this displayed energy that doesn't go anywhere. So what uh, I've done with okay. the energy, you know, you know, nobody's called me, hey, Jay, I need your help with this. You know, mom, mom needs my help with this. Brother needs help with this. So that energy that all people possess has to go somewhere. Now, with my personality, which makes me special, and with what naturally occurs in every human being, I have taken that energy and decided that I want to help families, what I don't have. I want to help families connect. And that's how I got into it. And I'm glad you've given us some background into why. You know, that, that's really special that you're using that energy that's, you know, to give and help other people. Thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 really, it's, really, it's really special. So in terms of, on the flip side of, of adversity, let's look at, um, you know, let's, let's look at happiness. You know, what does, it, what does happiness look like? You know, you've helped, you know, families uh, as part of your business um, go from, you know, perhaps challenging, perhaps despair, you know, to, you know, guiding them through being, you know, a good parent, being a good leader, 
and, and, and hopefully guiding them towards success and happiness. You know, what does, what does happiness, you know, you've seen it with, in other people, um, but what does happiness look like to you? And what is the difference between short-term and long-term happiness? What does that look like to you? So I would say for, for the majority of my, you know, let, let's say nine, from 19 forward, um, the majority of my happiness has been driven by serving. Um, you know, mm. it's, yeah, I don't really want like a trophy. It's just, I'm just being honest. Um, you know, there's something that I get from giving that's irreplaceable. And honestly, if I didn't give, um, I don't, I would not be happy. Like I, I really, for me, um, now, you know, I don't know how necessarily healthy it is to dedicate everything for so long to, to others. Eventually, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know my, my selfishness is my selflessness. Do yeah. You, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I feel that. I feel that. So that's what my happiness is. Now, over time, I'm trying to pull back that a little bit because it, it's, it's come at the expense of, of some, for example, I don't know exactly what makes Jason happy. So I, I probably for the past six months or so, I've been working on finding out what that is. Um, mm. I know that I'm artistic. I, I, I love to, uh, I used to love, I went to, originally I went to school for art to draw and paint. I haven't drawn or paint since, since, since college, which is, you know, now we're talking about, so 98, 99, 2000. Uh, I haven't painted since then, but I, I love to paint. Um, I, I like to draw. I love music. I used to make music, um, hip hop, R and B type instrumentals. Um, sure. but I haven't done it for years. Um, my daughter absolutely makes me happy. Um, I'm just on a quest to really figure out in life what what kind of fills me up that more than just giving. You know, I <laughs> I know it must sound so crazy, um, but I'm really one of those people. If you, if you check the resume, it's a very long time giving, um, uh, being other directed, being self directed. But um, I know that whenever I I love water and swimming, you know, it makes me happy to be around water. Um, as I, said, I don't, you can't really tell in the background, but there's a painting of an ocean behind me, um, and I think I'm really I'm trying to I, for, I love the question because. That's the question that I'm working on answering currently. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people are trying to, which is why I wanted to ask that because I think a lot of people don't ask don't ask themselves because you know a lot of people are, are working, are, you know, are working, living life, and, and just generally moving so fast, and you know, life just goes by so quickly that they don't ask the question, you know, right. what makes me happy. Uh, they don't even know if they're happy or not. You know, I think most people don't know if they're happy or not. You know, they, which is why I asked. You know, is the short term a long term happiness? You know, we go through different stages in our lives. We go through stages where, you know, career is the only thing that's important to us. So, you know, achieving things in our career make us happy. Then we become parents, and like you said, you know, your, you know, Jasmine makes you happy. And 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 at certain stages, you have different levels of of happiness, um, and and different things make you happy. Which is why you know I, I want to ask you question because you've seen so many parents you know go through this journey so, so on, on that note you know you know you you've gone through you know a level of this to yourself you've um you've you found you know your passion of you know serving um and helping others and family you know you kind of know what uh makes you happy now you've seen other people be happy and what makes them happy uh, a career and business perspective is happiness and success the same thing? You know, can you be successful at your career? And is that what makes you happy? Is success and happiness the same thing? So that, I, I think they're both very different things. Um, you know, people can be successful like in a certain arena, multiple arenas. So you, I'm not saying you're just successful in one thing. You can have multiple successes. And success is, when you're successful, it feels good it doesn't necessarily make you feel happy. That's why you have people with tons and tons of money who give it up for, for various reasons. Uh, so you know, the, I definitely agree that success and happiness are different. You could be successful and happy, but you, can't, you, you might not necessarily be successful and happy. 
You know, sure. you can be happy and not successful. They're definitely very different. They, 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 there is an and, there's happiness and there's, there's success. There's not an or, happiness or success. You know, so how do you, how um, do you define success then? What what does success actually mean? Success, I think, is is boils down to results. They're kind of mutually like success equals results. Like I am extremely successful at going to a person's house. If you have an eight year old or a seven year old or a three year old, anybody under ten, um, parents get about a good decade to to get their sleep schedule together. After that. The, the, the rhythms, the archaic rhythm, I, I'm not saying like, whatever rhythms that, that we, we fall into for sleep patterns are kind of established. So if you're under 10, the younger the better. Um, I go to your house, I'm very successful. If you want your kid to bed by 8.30, no, they are not at sleep by 8.30. However, they will be in bed, they will be wound down, their books will be away, the shades will be closed, the lights will be out, they will not be coming back out of their room and they are in their bed. And then maybe 15, 20 minutes later, they'll be knocked out. Because they, they calm themselves down, the child calm themselves down enough, I'm sorry, the parent created an environment for the child to be successful to go to sleep. So, um, I, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question, I, I lost Yeah, it. yeah, you did, I mean, to be but, fair. But yeah, to, yeah you did. Sleep. You can be successful at basketball. You can be successful at routines. You can be successful. Success is much easier than happiness. It's much easier to be successful. I think that's yeah. why people get driven to success. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I see. Because 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 there's a level of control, I guess, on over success you can do. Yeah. Absolutely. I see what you mean. But 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 going back to your scenario about the kids, fifteen minutes in bed. You know that. That sounds like success and happiness in my household, Jason. If my entire life was dedicated, that'd be my success. That'd be my success story. That <laughs> having my kids in bed, and, yeah, absolutely. Um, I hear that, and you know what? It, it took. I had a lot of practice because it's very. It's it's funny to say like here. My my nap times and my bed times are always the same. My my butter. You know, it's um. I don't even use a lot of the things that I teach. I just use the key elements. But basically, she, it's, it's a, when she's with me, it goes, okay, Jasmine, time for bed. She'll usually come over to me. I'll, I'll carry her over to her. She's still in a crib because she's still kind of petite. She's not really very big yet. Um, and give her a kiss, tell her I love her. I don't have to read her story. I put her down. I have a fan on. I put a fan for some noise. I, 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 I put the shades to see you tomorrow. And then I leave. That's wow. why, whether it's, wow. nap time, whether it's a nap time routine or whether it's a bedtime routine, occasionally she'll huff and puff, but um, within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, she's knocked out. Now, that took a lot of, in the trenches, of, which started, one, when I was at the psychiatric hospital for children, they had a nap time. There was a time where they had to go to bed. So I went through all the stages that I think a natural parent goes through. It was super frustrating. Some kids would knock out right away. Other kids would run around the room. Some of them, I had to bring them back to their mat. Some of them, if I didn't sit next to them, they were going to get up and wake up the next person. Um, some, some of the kids, I had to gently like keep them laying down. Sure. Otherwise, they wouldn't calm down because they needed some kind of like pressure on their back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some kids do. Some kids do, yeah. Right. So... I was being trained as a parent in a psychiatric hospital without knowing it. Yeah, so yeah. yes, kudos to me, but I also learned, I was also teaching kids how to self-hypnotize. Um, so I would train them to like lay down flat on their back, like lay like a pencil. So kids are very concrete. So I didn't know this from the beginning. It developed over about 18 months. But by the time I left, I could say like, okay, lay like a pencil or lay like a marker, they, they lay like a marker. And then I teach them to look up at a certain spot that was like a little bit behind them. And eventually their eyes would close. So I went through all, like I had a crash course in how to get all children to sleep. So once I had that, it was very hard. That crap was hard to learn. It was very frustrating. At one point in the, in, in, in the, in the system, they came in and they're like, you can no longer, we no longer require a rest time. There's, we can't call it a nap time. 
They can't go to sleep because we won't get paid if because Medicaid is the funding source. I won't, see. Yeah. Won't pay it because this is a hospital setting. You can't go to bed. So I was my, myself and my partners and my staff. Other uh, not my job, but I wasn't the boss. We had we had uh, a team. Every teacher we were called activity therapists. Every teacher was floored. We worked so hard to figure out how to get these kids calm, how to get them to sleep. We had a system in place. And then all of a sudden you're like, you can't make them sleep. And it's like, it blew all of our minds. So I had to learn a way to not physically keep them down. I had to learn ways that my words were, sure. were more powerful than my actions. Because really I was teaching them, if I'm bigger and stronger than you, I can make you do something. Mm. So what, th what they're learning is this is what I do on children's on, on people smaller and weaker than me. So the actual program did not know that it was actually more about money. It wasn't about actually caring about the kids. It was yeah, just like, yeah. you have a nap time, well, now you can. So I learned ways like, to deal with the children who would not go to sleep, how to keep them entertained so they were not bothering the other kids who did actually sleep. So. Mm -hmm. I had, and I did that with, by the time I left the program, it probably had been like a hundred different children sure. that I had a sense of like, oh, this is how to handle this kind of sleep. Yeah, this yeah. Kind of Amazing. So by the time I was a stepdad, it was much easier than dealing with those kids. And I, I knew exactly the pitfalls. I knew what to say. I knew what not to say. So by that time with my stepkids, I had helped their mother get them to bed very, very quickly. She didn't believe it. Fantastic. She was like, oh, it's so easy. Why don't you do it? And, you know, so I became, <laughs> in charge of bed I became in charge of bedtime routines and morning routines because it was too frustrating. And long story short, I also, I go into people's houses and help parents get their kids to bed. So I have hundreds of, like, I have thousands of interactions with getting mm. kids to go to bed. Yeah, you've been exposed to so many different variations and variables of different objections of going to bed and how to and, and tantrums and screaming that you 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 can you've basically built a formula of yeah. how to yeah that's fascinating yeah. absolutely fascinating. And, and in parents' defense, I always say this: parents are typically responsible, and it depends. Every culture is a little bit different, but here's my personal average: the average parent a family has two to five children in their life, roughly. I work with communities that have up to 12 children. It is what it is. But you cannot gain conclusive formulas for only adapting skill sets of two to five children. You're not going to be an expert in it. No, of course. So what's the difference between an expert and somebody who's a beginner? Well, the, I forget his name, but it talks about 10,000 experience. That's 10, right. Hours. That's right. Yeah, yeah 10, that's 10,000 right. hours. Mm. I got my 10,000, I, I got my 10,000 hours yeah. plus and I don't stop. I do it every day. So that's when I walk in, I'm like an NBA basketball player. Yeah, when I yeah. walk in, my skill set is of a high um, professional hockey, professional soccer. That, and the thing is, we don't, the bar, we, People don't really care about that. They want their kids to listen, but nobody wants to live to be an all-star NBA, NHL, you know, soccer league level parent. It's just, that's not what we're built for. We're yeah. humans. The bar is pretty low. If the bar was that hard, we wouldn't survive and we wouldn't continue to live as humans. So I fell into all this and I just personally love it. I just love it. That's I, fantastic. I treat it like a sport. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that, that's that. It, of all the things that you've gone through from as a child growing up to helping uh, to to working in the psychiatric hospital and, and working in your you know building your career your skills, um, and to now you know running your own uh, your running your own your own show having been a parent yourself now having brought up you know your stepkids of all that experience. What would you now, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? First and foremost, I cannot tell you what's going to happen because you will not, you will choose to not participate. 
So I am deliberately not going to tell you what you're going to experience for the next 12 years because you will not make it to where I am right now <laughs> if you know what's ahead of you. That is honestly, very good. That's you know, very that, good. Might be one, two, that might be that's one, two, and three. Yeah, yeah that's very good. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. <laughs> that's very true. That's very, that's very, that's very true. Actually, I never thought live about it, that. Live it, experience it, and just know everything's gonna be okay. Is the second thing. Live it, experience it. Everything's gonna be okay. And I honestly knew my passion when I was nineteen. So it was just a year away. So I'm gonna say my nineteen-year-old self um, for my third thing. When I was nineteen. I read a book that changed my life. I started meditating and um, I knew at 19, I didn't know what it was gonna look like. I didn't know how I was gonna get there, but I knew exactly what I was gonna do. I was gonna help people, I was gonna serve people, serve families, I knew that I was gonna help people. What I did not know that I, I, would, I would definitely get there, but there would be significant off-ramps that I wouldn't know were relevant to get me there but they were necessary and they were needed. So speaking to my 19 year old self, my, the third thing I would say is, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna help people, it's gonna happen. And you are gonna have three or four major, major things that are gonna steer, you're not gonna know how it connects to your vision and to your goal and to your mission, but you are going to, you have to go through it. About three or four major events, and you can count them. Once you get to the fourth thing, there might be five, but you're gonna have a number of events that are necessary. Count them down, you know, you take your hand, okay, I got four left, but I can't, I'm not gonna tell you how many years are spread apart. I'm not gonna tell you any of that. So that's, those are the three things I would tell myself. Fantastic, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's absolutely excellent advice not to tell yourself exactly what you're gonna go through because you won't go through it. I won't, hell no. <laughs> I say That's that with passion because we want, you know, we want, we want, we want, and we want it now. Um, but what I would say is that there were events at the psychiatric hospital um, that I wish I never had to face leaving. Um, there was, um, you know, going through the marriage and being a stepdad that I never saw coming. I was prepared, but I didn't see it coming. Um, there were events post with uh, my daughter's mother. Um, that I could not predict. Uh, also within my business, I feel like my business probably died and was reborn within the same company about three or four times. Interesting. That's interesting. In, in terms of well, when you when you say that, um, do you mean it, it died and you you pivoted or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. So, so for example, originally my. So originally I worked at an agency where for eight years that I was able to develop my company, the in-home parent coach on the side. So I had the flexibility. I advise you never jump from one thing if you don't have something set. So I did, I was just young enough, you know, uh, by the time I was 30, I, I, well, I, I officially worked for myself for the past five, six years. But prior to that, I spent eight years working for somebody in the same industry that I got a lot of freedom to iron out the kinks of how I was going to run my program. And then once it got set up to replace that income and go beyond, it was a natural progression to leave the job. So that was the, that was the strategy. Then when I got the job about 2010, let's say 2010, um, I started making uh, connections with the, the counties, um, state level government to give referrals and to provide in-home therapy. So originally I was hired as a parent coaching company. I go in, I teach a 12 week program um, and the actual organization paid for it out of their pocket, what was called flex funding. So the state, the government didn't pay for it, but they did out of their pocket. And for the first like two years, I had got like 25 parent coaches working my program. I was doing it myself. It was in one county and I put all my eggs in one basket. And then there was a governmental shift in terms of allocation of funds where those organizations were not, they didn't have the same amount of funding, but they had an increase of children that needed services. 
So they could no longer provide what was called flex funds. Think of it like a big petty cash. That's right. That's right. A big petty cash fund for services like tutoring and parent coaching. And if families need cleats, cleats for soccer, um, a family can't afford the rent one month. You know, there was an allocation of funds that was given to families and parent coaching was not considered therapy. So it couldn't be covered by the governmental Medicaid. So when the organization was not getting the same amount of funds, I think they were given maybe like 400, 500,000 a year to, to, to work with about a cap of three to 400 families or 400 wow. families, okay. max 500 families. So that one organization was like my bread and butter. We love sure. your service. It's like a Cadillac of services. They said, you know, build your parent coach team up. You know, I thought that was all my business was ever going to be. In one county, in part of the state, our state has 15, 15 counties. So I put all my eggs in one basket. So when there was that shift of funding where they could no longer pay with that petty cash, they were only giving services like therapy that they didn't have to pay for out of their pocket. All my families went away. Crazy. That's that, crazy. That, that, I, that must have been like a ton of bricks, I, right? Right. Now, luckily, when I, when I was building up that parent coaching method, the state had a window of time where they allowed, they allowed you to apply for working to, to get funding, to be a provider that Medicaid would pay for. Sure. So while I was developing the parent coaching with no real security, I then, I caught the window and I applied to work with basically children with developmental disabilities. So around 2013-ish, I started, I raised my hand and said, I can work with children who are not verbal, aggressive. They, um, they don't like, um, they could be from two all the way to 19. Because my parent coaching skills, everything I had learned prior to, had prepared me to work with children who are what we call intellectually disabled uh, or, or um, intellectually dis uh, developmentally disabled, intellectually disabled. Previously mm. in the past, mentally challenged, way, sure. way, way in history, uh, mentally retarded. And we, don't, we can't say that anymore. But developmentally, intellectually uh, disabled. So all my skill set for working with children who have out of control behaviors, even though they didn't have the developmental disabilities of autism, the same strategies worked with the kids. So mm. I started personally doing, my model has always been the same. Parent coaching, I go in, show I can do a great job, get the results, and I get filled up. And then they're like, wow, you do such a great job. Like when I'm full, but I hired some people and they, they're working my method, my system, send them out. It's always been the method. So for parent coaching, that's how I built the parent coaching. With the therapy, I did the same thing. I did not originally know that parent coaching, the skill set for parent coaching was going to help me with the, with the children with developmental disabilities. It was like I made an educated guess that I could do it. Um, and I'm glad I did because that was the birth of kind of the company that I have now, which has emerged to providing parent coaching services, in-home therapy for children with uh, um, depression, anxiety, mental health disorders, and the majority of my business now is, is in-home therapy for children with developmental disabilities. So it has, my own company, all under the in-home parent coach, had to reinvent itself about three times before wow. the pandemic. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that's fascinating because what you've done there is you've just adapted to the environment. You just adapted yeah. to the, 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 the demands. You've adapted to, you know, financial constraints from, you know, from funding. Uh, and you've basically adapted. And actually, all those challenges, all those restraints, and all those um, hurdles have actually helped you develop uh, the home, the in home parent coach brand, right? All right. I'm so happy that we actually we, we covered this because obviously you and I have been I've been wanting to you know I know that we, you know you interviewed me um, some time ago before the whole pandemic. Um, and I've been really wanting to now follow your posts, but I think today's chat has really been an eye-opener in terms of um, your own journey 
uh, not as just as a parent, but as you know, I, I guess you've been a parent for a long time, like you said, without actually being a parent. That differs a lot from a lot of my other views in that, you know, a lot of people, when they're uh, parents, they get thrown into a situation, but you've been living this life all the way up to becoming, before becoming a parent yourself. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's been fascinating. It's been fascinating. That's why but, I have so much compassion for parents. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, to have you on the show. Um, I've learned a lot today. It's such a, an honorable thing that you're doing at the moment. Jason, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. You have a great day. Hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, I'd be really grateful if you'd give me a like or a review. For more exclusive content, hop over to my website, dadcoshow.com. Bye for now. Thank you.